LET is a little bit different, but one of the reasons that I like it and I think it's kind of fun to bring is it's just, it's a different sort of thing than just about anything we have. Um, it gets a kind of nice roasted grain flavor and it's, um, yeah, just something, something very different. Uh, so we have, I'm sorry, my, the tripod is a That's little okay. bit in your way. I just, I have to try and get it far enough away from me that I don't feel like it's sucking out my brain. <laughs> right? Like just to try and make it a little bit of a good picture. And if it's too far on the side, it, sometimes it looks funny when I upload it to YouTube later. Um, so today we begin with Jesus' pass, this Passover celebration that he has. And for this one, he doesn't go to Jerusalem. Now, why do you think that's kind of weird? Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem for Passover. He's not ready for what's going to happen. That's a part of it. But there's this interesting puzzle in the scriptures because God said in the Old Testament that every man, every, I think it's every man in Israel who's over 12 must come to Jerusalem for Passover, for Pentecost, and for Tabernacles, the three pilgrimage festivals they're called. So why doesn't Jesus go if he's supposed to? He's trying to teach them that the new So there's definitely, Vicky is right. See, even in my brain, I still heard Nancy first, but her name is Vicky. I don't know why. <laughs> One day we're going to find out something really funny, like her parents thought of naming her Nancy first and then switched to Vicky. But Vicky's right. There, there is a sense that Jesus is doing something new with his Passover that's different. So there, that's one of the pieces of it, um, that he's inaugurating a new covenant. And this is kind of maybe constructed. That's a stronger word than I would like. But it seems like what John is doing in his gospel is he's building a scene, that this is literary. He's putting things into place to illustrate a point. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen that way, but it seems odd, for instance, that in the Gospel of John, there's no Last Supper narrative. They, he doesn't have the same kind of Last Supper thing. Jesus and his apostles gather in the Gospel for the Last Supper, but then he launches into these big, long discourses about um, like the vine and the branches and the house of the Father, the, you know, those kind of things. But he doesn't say Jesus took bread and he took wine and he blessed it and said, you know, that part. Other three Gospels, it's all narrated. And in the Gospel of John, it's not. But he has this discourse. So it's kind of, it seems like John, as the author of the Gospel, may have been inspired to kind of build this scene out of the life of Jesus. Um, and like I said, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but just that when we give the Bible freedom to be a literary work, it's helpful. Because you can see some of this, and some of it does feel um, like, did Jesus give this entire discourse at this time in his life? And the answer is, we're not exactly sure. He may have, but he may not have. And either way, isn't about like, it doesn't affect our faith. What we want to do is pay attention to what he said, not worry so much about when he said it. Um, that it, it's more important to hear his words. Does that kind of make sense? Um, you know, so because what happens is when you read, if you decide, like, you want to read scripture commentaries on the Gospel of John, lots of authors will spend like 50 pages talking about that problem. And it's like, well, who cares? Like, it's more important to learn about the words of Jesus and what they mean than exactly whether this happened like this or not and what the Greek, you know, for this is and that is. 
Um, we want to try and pay attention to him. So a piece of it is that he is inaugurating this new covenant. But what else do you think could be at work here? There's some other things that are probably a part of it, which are good to know, and how the law works. Well, I thought he didn't want to be crowned a human king. He doesn't want to be crowned a human king. That could be a part of it too. Yeah, the people decide that they want to make him a king. And, you know, he is cautious about the crowds and the people at Passover in Jerusalem. Um, because it was a big deal. It was a massive pilgrimage festival. People came from all over the world to it. But what would be another reason that he wouldn't go? The new Passover. Yep, so we have the new Passover. That's what Vicky was mentioning. But it's the same reason sometimes why we don't travel today. It could be the weather. It could be other things. It could be too expensive. You have to remember that it's a journey of days from Galilee down to Jerusalem and a journey of some days back. That's expensive to have all of the food along the way, to have all of the provisions that you need. And you have to remember that Jesus lives in what is called uh, like a subsistence world. Does anyone know what subsistence living means? You eat what you grow, that most of human labor is involved in the production of food. And to have the leisure to do other things is not very present. Our culture today has moved dramatically away from subsistence culture here in the United States. That there's actually very few people involved in the production of food, and most of us hardly spend any time thinking about it because we do other things, there's service work, and there's different kinds of things. But Jesus lives in a subsistence world. So if you're living in a subsistence world, maybe some of you either grew up on a dairy farm, or you knew what it was like to be on a farm. Could you just leave your cows for a week? No. Like someone always had to stay home. You even have to milk on Sunday, because cows, when they're producing milk, get rather grouchy if you don't milk them. At least that's what I've heard. I was not a farm kid if you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but it could be too expensive. Jesus doesn't, he, I mean, he seems to have received money from people. His disciples kept a money bag. But you also have to suspect about him that he was relatively free in giving it away. And he wasn't very attached. And if they found people in need, they probably assisted them in the ways that they could. And sometimes it seems like they bought food from people in the area or different things. So he's out kind of in the region of Galilee. And there's some themes that start to come together here. We talked about manna in the wilderness. And I have in my notes the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. What do you think that is about? Where does a tree of life show up in the Garden of Eden? Ah, incorrect. You're close, but incorrect. The tree of knowledge of good and evil they weren't supposed to eat from. The, that Jesus offers eternal life. He talks about eternal food, that this is the food of heaven. Yep, we're on the right track. There's a theme in Jewish thought. Um, one of these days, I really do intend to pick up the Talmud and read it. The good old, like, 30,000 pages, because they talk about some of these things. But in the Garden of Eden, as you read the story of the scriptures, there's actually two trees. And in a sense, you have to choose to eat from one of them. And you can only choose one. So if you eat from the tree of life, what do you have? life, eternal life with God. If you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you supposedly gain knowledge, but it kind of doesn't work. And what happened? Yeah. Original sin and death. Exactly. But it, there's this theme. What you'll notice is that in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation, it talks about how at the end of the world, 
There's trees whose fruit brings healing and they produce fruit constantly. There's this renewal of the tree of life. And if you read Genesis very carefully, one of the things that God actually says and one of the reasons that he chases Adam and Eve out of the garden is so that they don't eat from the tree of life so that they don't live forever. Why do you think that would be? Why would God not want them to live forever? Because they had sinned. They had sinned. They have sinned, and what does that mean? Death will die. Well, or that the world is now fallen and things are broken. Right? They've crossed the boundary that's kind of a definitive choice. And to live forever in a broken world without hope of salvation, you know, without... Think, I mean, think of this. Like, how many of you would actually like to live forever if you had to stay here? You know, can you imagine having cancer for a hundred years? and all of these other things. Like, once the fall happens, living forever here in this world is a really bad idea. Because life doesn't really get better. They tell me as you get older that you feel more aches and pains and not less. <laughs> so there's, I mean, I don't know, I'm not quite there yet, but maybe. But you can see that something about this discourse is bringing back up this theme of the tree of life and eternal light. And there's this contrast between the food of earth that we have to keep eating and the food from heaven that satisfies. So that tree of life theme is important. That one's new. We haven't really talked about it before, but it is definitely an important one. And then there's the banquet of wisdom. And the banquet of wisdom is something that you don't expect right away because it's buried in the middle of the book of Proverbs. And I would argue that the book of Proverbs is the hardest book in the entire Bible to read. Any idea why? Outside of the banquet of wisdom, there's like no stories. The sentences aren't linked together. It's just like a list of things. So the wise man does this, the dumb man does that, the wise man does this, the, you know, whatever, the foolish man does that. And it, like you don't get to read anything, like there's no characters, they don't do anything, it's just a bunch of pithy sayings. You have a short attention span, the proverb is great. <laughs> it's true, however, I would say, Mr. Turner, that that also proves my point, because when you have a short attention span, it takes a long time to read the book of Proverbs. <laughs> But anyway, if you dig through it in the middle of it, I forget, I think they have the reference in the commentary, but I think it's in chapter 8 or 9 after you get into the book of Proverbs a ways. All of a sudden there's this thing, this sort of symbolic theme about wisdom preparing a banquet for her followers, a banquet of rich food. It shows up in the book of wisdom as well. And there's something about wisdom and the metaphor of feeding people. That wisdom, being a wise man, is like having a kind of food. Those are all things that we need to remember. So Jesus goes up at the beginning of chapter 6. I think I was going to look this up. Because I think I put something in the wrong spot. Okay, yep, I did. Um, Jesus went up to the mountain alone. actually happens at the end of this section, and I'm not at the beginning. So that's in the wrong spot in my notes. Um, I was compiling them from different places, like reading several different commentaries and different things, and so they weren't all in the right order. But Jesus goes up on the mountain, and he sits down, and he gathers a crowd of people around him. Do you remember what other event in another gospel happens where Jesus goes up a mountain and sits down? Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, which we call part of the... The Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus enumerates sort of the teaching of the kingdom, right? So there's another 
link to ponder there as well, that somehow being fed by the Lord like this is also related to his teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus doesn't go up to the temple. We talked about that. It probably is mostly because he is inaugurating the new covenant, that he is doing something new that's different than the temple. And remember we talked in chapter 4 about the woman at the well and this new worship that Jesus brings and how it's not here, there on Mount Gerizim, or in Jerusalem that people will worship the Father, but they will worship in spirit and in truth, that it's about worshiping God from a new, from a new what? We talked about this last time. Were you paying attention? <laughs> from a new relationship, that when we worship God in Jesus, what we've discovered, a primary piece of the new covenant is that we stand in a new relationship to God, that we are His sons and daughters by adoption and by grace, brothers and sisters of Christ, and not just like people and God, creator and creation. So he's doing something different than the temple ritual. And this is something important too, because the temple ritual involves a whole lot of blood. Because they take all of these lambs, probably thousands and thousands of them for people, because each family has to eat part of the lamb, or they have to share with um, other families if their family is too small. Um, but that means thousands of lambs are going to be slaughtered in the temple. Their blood is collected, it's poured out at the base of the altar, and then the lambs are skinned and roasted and those kind of things. Is there any blood in this story of Jesus? Here, now, at the feeding of the 5,000? No. no. This is the same kind of thing that has happened in the church. That we moved away from the bloody sacrificial system and the blood of animals and bulls and goats to the blood of the unblemished lamb that is present in the sacrament of the Eucharist, but is present... Um, sacramentally, you could say symbolically as long as you don't push the word too far in English because it is a true presence but it's also a symbol. It you know, still looks like wine and tastes like wine. It's not usually human blood in the same way. Um, and then he says, have the people recline. Have any of you actually taken me up on the offer of trying to eat a meal while you're reclined? Okay, this is your goal for this week. You have to try this. You could do it with breakfast or with chips or whatever, but like lay on your side, you know, and you have to lean on your arm and then you have to try and eat. Is that a fun position to eat in? No, it's hard. It's, it's hard, but that should tell us something. Why does Jesus say to recline? Who were the kind of people that ate while they were reclined? The rich people, the wealthy, the kings. It's a position of sort of wealth and authority and relaxation, you could say, of enjoying a banquet. It's still not very comfortable. If you try it, it's like, why did they eat this way? Chairs were a much better idea. If you eat a meal reclined, you also basically have to be served because you can't reach very far. But note, like, so for instance, the images of the Last Supper and the apostles that we have of them all sitting on chairs next to Jesus are fake. <laughs> because it says they ate reclining and we often have apostles and Jesus sitting and not reclining. <laughs> now, you probably didn't eat the whole meal that way because it's just really not practical. But there's things like that that you have to under, you know, you have to feel the difference. But here this is important because the people are reclining and that's what you do at a Passover meal. But at a Passover meal, the 
flesh of the lamb, the roasted lamb, is essential. Well, where's the roasted lamb in the Passover meal of Jesus? There isn't one. It's not there. There's fish and bread, and that's it. So you see, like, those little details are actually insights into the story. Like, wait a minute, they're reclining. This sounds like a Passover. The scriptures actually tell you that it's at Passover time. And this is, the Passover is the great time of the movement from the land of sin and slavery to the place of the covenant, the place where you encounter God, to the land of freedom, the land of the promise. Um, so you have this kind of movement, you have this theme of Passover. Passover is about a covenant meal, and now they're going to eat this kind of covenant meal. So Jesus asks, and I think he said this with a smile. This is kind of funny. How are you going to feed them? You know, and his apostles probably had their eyes pop out of their heads because this is the same kind of thing like when you all are in the kitchen at church and you prepared for like 100 people and then 5,000 people showed up and now your eyeballs are popping out of your head and you're scrambling to figure out what you're going to do. Yep, that's what the apostles are doing. You know, they have some money, but they know they don't have enough. One would wonder whether people would go so far from their homes without food. But there's a part of this story which I really enjoy. Um, and it's so easy to miss. And so I put it in one of the questions. The young boy they get the food from. What do you think was going through his mind? Because in the end, what does he give? Everything. Everything he has. When he gives it, what is he going to get back? Nothing. He doesn't know. He gives it to Jesus without knowing what the return is going to be. It's a very strong possibility if there's 5,000 people and you give him all the food that there's not going to be food left. Right? Mm -hmm. And you have to, this is one of those places where I think it's good for us to work on the mental discipline of not jumping ahead in the story. Because when you see that, you see that in a sense, the character in the story with the most faith is this young boy. He gives Jesus everything he had and he had no idea what was going to happen with it. The apostles were concerned about worldly things. The people were probably hungry. You could imagine that maybe this boy was fishing and on his way home, that he was supposed to feed his family, that this was food for his family. I mean, remember, it's a subsistence culture that's very, very possible. And he gives Jesus everything he had. Think about that kind of trust. How would Jesus look at the little boy? You know, what would he say? What would he do? It's such, it can be such a place of prayer and an entrance into the story. Because all these other people are worried about so many things. And what you have is a young boy who demonstrates faith that is very, very real and profound. Now in the end, he gets, I think they probably sent at least one of the baskets of bread home with him, right? Like, you did this, you gave the food. There's a reward for that. But he doesn't know what he's going to get back at first. And think about the delight of Jesus in his faith. That he shows himself to be a true disciple, much more so than the other people in the story. And I think that's a beautiful thing. It's a detail that's easy to miss, that there's this boy who has food, and he's the only one. Now, also, oddly enough, the fish almost disappear from the story completely. Maybe they didn't like fish either. <laughs> that's not actually true, because fish was a major part of their diet, because you could catch it, you know, that it was... It was uh, more plentiful or more readily available. They didn't eat a lot of meat in general. But you have the boy. It's barley loaves. Barley loaves are food for the poor because even if you look, I've always wanted to make barley loaves. 
So one of you wants to be adventurous. It would be fun someday to bring barley, a barley loaf to Bible study and we could taste it. Because what happens is the barley is different enough than wheat that it can't, it doesn't rise like wheat bread does, so it stays denser and thinner because the structure of the grain doesn't support, it doesn't have enough protein or gluten or whatever the molecule is that makes it rise well. So it doesn't rise very well, it's not very high quality bread. But it would be kind of a fun thing. Okay, I've always wanted to try mixing milk and honey too, like warm milk and honey because it talks about the Holy Land flowing with milk and honey all the time. I've wanted to taste that and see what it's like. And the reason, the reason why is because I think it, it helps us get a little bit of an insight. Those kind of things might seem kind of foolish, like, well, why try barley loaves? Why have milk and honey? But you can taste and you can touch a little bit of the world that Jesus lived in, that it, it gives us different senses and a deeper experience of it. And sometimes it's just kind of fun. So then they compare Jesus and Elijah. And Elijah in the Old Testament had multiplied loaves to feed a um, hundred people, 20 loaves to feed a hundred people, which was still considered miraculous. Jesus multiplies five loaves to feed 5,000 people. Um, and here's one of the pieces that lots of people get caught up on is how many people were there? And things will say, well, it's 5,000 men without women and children. Have you ever seen a crowd of 5,000 people? Do you go like, oh, one, two, oh, can't count them, nope, not that one, nope, 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 three, four, not all of them, right? That just, it's like, I don't know, that would make me scratch my head. My guess is it's saying there were about 5,000 people there, unless they had the men and the women sitting in different areas, which they could have, because they did in synagogues and different things. But I just, if there's a big crowd of people, you don't really like, okay, you know, all the kids, raise your hand. How many are there? That doesn't work. Did the men eat first in that culture? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't, those are a lot of things that are fun to look up and to learn. Like how, how would they have eaten together? I mean, there were definitely cultural norms that are different than now. Like for a man to visit with a woman in public was almost unheard of. Jesus kind of gets in trouble for that in chapter four. Um, you know, so there's other cultural pieces and I don't know how they would have, if they would have served the men first, if they would have served the women first. My guess is you would have served the kids first because if you didn't, they would be screaming. <laughs> and parents don't like screaming kids. Um, it's, just, it's just kind of the way it works. Um, one of the other things is that note that when you give God everything, when you open your heart to Him, when you entrust everything to Him, that it's enough. It doesn't matter how much it is in the worldly sense. God can make an abundance out of nothing. He can create out of nothing. But what He desires from us is our hearts. What He desires from us is everything. Whether it seems like enough or not. And there's lots of times when that happens in our lives as well. Um, he says, gather the fragments. Now, remember how manna, if you read the story, manna is kind of weird. The name actually means, what is it? It's kind of this funny thing in Hebrew because manna means like, what is it? It's a funny thing to call the food. And Moses is like, it's the bread from heaven. And the people are all like, really? What do we do? Gather it up. Oh, okay. Because if you didn't, it like melted or disappeared or went bad or went rancid or something. This is part of the story of the Old Testament, right? But what happens to the fragments of bread here? They gather them up and they put them in baskets. And who does that? The disciples, the 12 apostles. And this is an image that has been classically used for the church. Who multiplied the bread? Jesus did himself, but who distributed it? The apostles. And so there's this kind of human agency in divine action that even though God is the one that does it, 
it's entrusted, the task is entrusted to the apostles to carry out. That they are the ministers even in the story. So it's kind of neat when you can see that. They gather the fragments because in the case of the manna, it disappeared. In the case of the bread from heaven that Jesus is going to give, it's bread that will last forever. So here it's preserved, it's not lost. That something greater than what Moses had and the people had with manna is happening here. And this is just the introduction to it. The life in the covenant, they're in a grassy plain. Where did the people get the manna? In the desert. Which one would you rather be in? Grassy plain. Grassy plain. Me too. I would rather not have to fight with my uh, fight for food with scorpions or snakes or spicy cactuses or any or spiky cactuses or anything like that. Not spicy cactuses either. <laughs> Um, one of the things that is important, too, is that there is a biblical image. Being fed with bread from God is a biblical image of what? We've encountered it before. At least maybe a little bit, or sideways. It's an image for studying the scriptures themselves. To hear the word of God is like eating divine bread. Um, and so that's one of the layers to the story because it is important to acknowledge that this is a time, and we've talked about this in the Gospel of John, how there's like a surface layer, the literal sense of the text, that Jesus is feeding 5,000 people, right? He's multiplying, there's a miracle there. But then there's several other layers that are at work. One of them is a reinterpretation of the Exodus story and the story of manna and Israel in the desert. Another one is the sort of symbolic interpretation that to feed on the bread from heaven is to encounter or to study the word of God. That's a rabbinical image. That's an image that Jesus uses several times. Um, and it's present here that it doesn't destroy the story to admit that there's symbolic things at work. The thing is, with Jesus, what's going to happen is the symbols are all going to link together and he wants them to point to a reality that's real, that's not only symbolic. But it doesn't hurt us to ponder, for instance, today, that eating the bread of God is studying the scriptures. That there's a link there that we don't want to lose. It's a poetic image, um, but it also is important because the words of Jesus, the teaching that he has to give, is more important than the miracle he does. Because the teaching of Jesus is what brings eternal life. Even though this is a great miracle and he fed people with five loaves of bread and two fish, what happened to the people? They still got hungry again. That even though it's a miracle and even though it's miraculous food, it didn't like fill their bodies for the rest of their lives. But the teaching of Jesus does. It fills our heart, it stays with us, it carries us toward eternal life. Okay, then Jesus sends the apostles out. He goes up the mountain alone. There's a sense of being alone with his Father. And what is the time of day when the apostles go out in the boat. It is night and dark. And again, there's layers to this. So why do you think it's night and dark? Remember the obvious answer first? Because it was night. Because they spent this day, he fed them, right? It's late in the day. Jesus goes up the mountain, the sun is setting, the apostles row out on the lake. So it's night because it's dark outside, right? They've spent a long day. But the reason why it's important to remember that first is that's the initial layer. But what else have we talked about in the Gospel of John that would poke at this light and dark thing? Jesus will say about himself, I am the light of the world. 
Jesus is not with the apostles in the boat, and so the apostles are in darkness, darkness because the light of the world isn't with them. So there's a literal sense of the text again. You have that it's probably actually night when they're out on the sea. And there's a spiritual sense that's very, very present. We've talked about it in the Gospel of John a lot. This light and darkness. Jesus as light, the way of God as light, the way of the world as darkness. The um, gift of grace as light, living in covenant with God, brings light to your soul. Outside of God, you're in darkness. So then what happens? They row out quite a ways from shore. And Jesus walks, Jesus comes out to them walking on the water. And here is something that, again, our English translations fail us miserably. Um, I wish they didn't do this so often, but they just, I don't know. Because it says that they, there's this little thing like they watch Jesus walking toward them on the water. But it uses a very specific word that means like they were in awe. They were amazed. They were trembling with fear of Jesus walking on the water. Why? Why would they be afraid of Jesus walking on the water? They first kind of think it's a ghost. That's very, very possible. It's not every day that you see people walking on the water. That would be a rather odd experience. But there's something more happening in the story. What is going on? It, I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with the book of Genesis. The, what, is, what happens at the beginning of creation? The Spirit of God hovers over the waters of chaos. And what do you have in the gospel? Jesus, manifested as God, hovering over the waters of chaos. Do you see how the image fits? And so what they're wondering at, what they're amazed at, is they recognize Jesus as the Lord of creation. He's just manifested this kind of miracle. Now they see him sort of in divine glory, walking on the water, and they gaze at him and they're terrified because there's this storm. But they also have made the connection with the book of Genesis. And how do we know that? Because when Jesus speaks, what does he say? That's not what he says. He's, wait, maybe, that is, maybe he says that first, but what comes next? Be not afraid or don't be afraid. But then he says, it is, I. it is I. And again, we are utterly and completely failed by English translations of the Bible. Because that's not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is, I am. And if Jesus says, I am, and he looks like the divine presence manifested over the waters, what should you think of? Our good old image that we've returned to a thousand times over. The burning bush and the divine name and the presence of God. So you have, like, you have this story, Jesus manifested as the presence of God. You have the apostles who contemplate, who wonder at him, who tremble with fear. And then Jesus uses the divine name. You see how it fits? And you just kind of scratch your head after you look at this for a while and you're like, Dear English translators, why did you break this story? Like, you should, you know Greek. He says, ego a me. And in this case, you translate it, it is I. Which is not a bad translation, but you never translate it like that anywhere else in the gospel because you know, you should know, that this is from the burning bush and that any Jew who's worth their salt would think of God at the burning bush who manifested his presence to Israel. And that's exactly how the disciples react. The pieces of the story fit together. They all fit. 
So you have all of these things. And then what happens? There's a rather odd part to the story. Once Jesus shows up, they, they're immediately at the shore. Now you have to wonder, like they weren't freaking out when they were like 10 feet from the shore and Jesus walked all the way over to them, right? So something about finding Jesus is also about finding peace, refuge from the storm, the light of the world. It's no longer dark. It's no longer night. That Jesus is revealing himself as God to his apostles here and now. So the people then notice that Jesus is missing. And the people are rather adventurous. So what do they do? They get in boats to go find him. They don't know where he went, but they're like, aha, he has disappeared. We are going to seek him out. And again, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. They want to find Jesus. They get in boats because boats are the fastest way to travel around the Sea of Galilee. Um, if you've seen the Sea of Galilee, you should know that it's deep in a valley and there's like mountains all around it. It goes like up a thousand feet from the surface of the lake to the surrounding countryside fairly quickly. There's a little bit of a plain around it, but it's not very wide, maybe a few hundred feet. So it's not easy just to walk around. It's much easier to go by boat. So they do, they go to Capernaum on the north side of the sea. And then Jesus kind of pokes them a little bit. He's like, why are you looking for me? You know, do not search for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures unto eternal life. Because they probably want to be fed again, right? But Jesus isn't really against feeding them. It's not that he's, you know, critiquing them overly much, but he's kind of saying that you should look for what endures. Do not think of the food that perishes. Remember, we're in the Middle East. Food goes bad much more quickly than it does here. It's warm, it's relatively humid, and they don't have food storage things. In North Dakota in the winter, as long as the temperature stays, most of us have a giant freezer, and you can actually keep things quite safe outside or in an unheated part of your house, right? It'll stay frozen like bricks. Um, not in Israel, at least not 99.99% .99 of the time. Food perishing would be a common thing. He also talks about the Father has set his seal on the Son. And this is a good word. This is the one on whom the Father has set his seal, right? It's the same kind of word that's used for baptism and confirmation and holy orders. The word, I think, I don't know if it's the exact word in Greek, but my suspicion is that it's probably character. And a character means like, the, the image comes from like a signet ring. Have you heard of a signet ring? What did you do with a signet ring? What was important about it? So you use a signet ring to seal wax to sort of give it your stamp of approval that it makes it what it is. You know, like the Pope, when he names a bishop, they actually, eventually the official document is written on very nice parchment and it comes with a lead seal that is from the Holy Father. Like they, I don't know, the Vatican has something, right? But it, it gives the document its authority. It gives it, it makes it what it is. That's what character means. It makes it what it is. So the Father has set his seal on the Son. And it's a character. So think of that because it helps illuminate what we mean when we talk about baptism and confirmation and holy orders. That it's like this kind of seal. It's something that makes you what you are when you receive those sacraments. That makes you, that changes you from the inside out. That's where a lot of sacramental teaching comes from. So the last piece that is worth mentioning, I think, in this section, and then we'll call it a day, is, um, so they ask him, what can we do to, 
What can we do to accomplish the work of God? And there's this sort of contrast, the work of man, the work of humanity with the work of God. And again, it's playing with layers. You should know that for much of the Old Testament, the word for work and the word for worship are the same. Which is part of the connection that our work and our daily life is part of what sanctifies us, what leads us to holiness, but it's also about worship. So the worship of God or the worship of man, that's also a profitable um, thing to think about. To accomplish the work of God, Jesus says, the work of God is that you believe in the one he has sent. And so there's something about belief that you have to cooperate with grace, that there's this faith that to do the work of God is first of all to believe. It's an act of faith. That doesn't mean it stops there. This isn't sola fide, that it's about faith alone. It doesn't say that. But to do the work of God is to start with faith. And you see this when you talk about miracles and when you talk about life. Some of you probably see this in your family, sadly, because you experience the difference in how people talk and how they relate to things with faith and without faith. When people are without faith, they look at the miracles of Jesus, they look at the events that happened, and they see it as an evil or it's wicked or why did this happen or it's hard to understand. You know, when you look at the crucifixion of Jesus without faith, it's horrible. It's awful. A man was bloodied and beaten to a pulp and died on a cross. Right? We can only see it differently because we believe in faith that it's not just his death on the cross. It's not that that was good, except because it was a victory of love. Except because it was something much more than just the death of a man on a cross. When you encounter Jesus and his miracles, you often see this. There's people who believe, who are open in their hearts, who choose to surrender to him, and they see the miracles as works of divine grace that confirm who Jesus is. If you have people without belief, usually what they'll say is, this is the work of the devil, this is smoke and mirrors, this is something, it's a deception, you know, or maybe at best in the modern world, someone like a doctor might say, well, we don't know how this happened. We can't describe how or why, right? But this dividing line of faith doesn't seem like a big deal until you see it, and then it is. I was visiting with one of my cousins, and this really hit home because he was rather upset that he watched my grandma die. Why would a good God make that happen for one of his followers? And it's, it's not a bad question, but as the conversation went on, what had happened was, for whatever reason, he wasn't approaching it with eyes of faith. He wasn't looking at it as an offering, as participating in the redemption of the world, you know, as an ability to suffer with Jesus, or the difficulty of crossing the threshold of death, but that it was a birth to new life. For him, it was this terrible evil that should be eliminated. And that dividing line of faith is a major one. And I think that's what Jesus is pointing to. That there's something about being on the inside and choosing to follow the Lord and choosing to surrender to Him, even if we don't always understand or it's not always clear, that faith is an action of the will that's determinative. It sets a course and it opens up possibilities. And without it, the possibilities are different. You don't see. So in the modern world, to lay hands on someone and pray for them to be healed in the name of Jesus, and it happens, when you see that in faith, you say, praise the Lord, this is a miracle. When you don't see it with faith, you say, well, maybe there's something about human touch that made it happen. Your body spontaneously decided to regenerate. You know, it has capacities or powers that we don't understand. That kind of stuff is mentioned all the time in medical literature and all the time by people who approach things without faith. So there's something real in that. 
All right, we better conclude for today. Sorry we went a little long. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen.